welcome to Creative Piecemeal Podcast, a podcast for creatives. I'm your host, Tammy Takeishi. Join me for compelling conversations with artists, actors, authors, musicians, and other creatives about the impact of the creative and fine arts in their lives and our ever-changing world. Thank you for listening. Hello, welcome to Creative Piecemeal. I'm your host, Tammy Takeishi. Today I am joined by the amazing musician and luthier Jonathan Wilson of Togaman Guitar Viols. He makes updated versions of arpeggionos, an instrument from the 1800s. And his instruments can be heard in a variety of places from movies to video games and beyond. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Tammy. Well, thank you for having me. I can't tell you how many times I've watched a movie or played a video game or heard a a song from one of my favorite bands and I'm like what is that instrument what is that sound and I finally put the puzzle pieces together it's it's your amazing stuff your guitar vials so who or what inspired you to get into being a luthier Uh, and then later on how did you decide to reinvent the arpeggio well you know it's uh it's interesting I mean I uh well first of all you know I grew up as a you know guitar player but it was not like I'd have this big uh warm fuzzy family it was like you know it was it was, it was tough as a kid I had uh, dad was a pub dwelling uh, uh police detective and and I was uh, my my mother unfortunately uh you know she took her life when I was three so the guitar came into my life at some point my dad it just gave it was it was better than any toy I could ever have you know I, believe me I stepped on a few Legos back in the day too but you know, so I was just fascinated with it as an object. So it just, I've always been making noise out of a guitar in some form. I guess, as you know, in those years, this was like the late 70s, early 80s, I was actually uh, really getting into guitar. Even in sixth grade, it's kind of funny. I, we had this class project uh, for a weekend, and then we had a substitute teacher who didn't know what to do with us. So uh, he says, uh, make a musical instrument over the weekend. And I'm like, okay. You know, he says, yeah, he goes, don't take a cereal box and bang a spoon on it and call it an instrument, you know, just, you know, try to get something. And these kids were coming in with different water filled glasses and things like that. It was pretty cool. But I came in with the cigar box guitar that was like uh, from a Tampa cigars or whatever I found in the garage. And it was a little plank of wood. And I just, you know, I already had had guitars around and knew how to tune them up a bit. So, and this is like sixth grade. Okay. So I was like taking a couple strings and putting a bridge on it. And I think I even made a case for the thing. And I, so I showed up, I probably got the only A I'd ever get in school, period, you know, because I, pretty much everything else was a total pun. I used to frustrate the English department a lot because they thought I had talent, you know, and then uh, I did well after a while, but you know what I mean? It's, it was a, it was a, not the easiest climb. So I didn't really think in terms of, gee, I want to be this dirty bearded luthier buried in sawdust, one of these crazy hippie type people, you know, with high glue and rosewood and shops and living in a van down by the river. I wasn't really uh, thinking in those terms. I mean, I was into rock guitar. I was a kid. Those were the days when we had loud amplifiers and bad haircuts. And it was just, you know, (laughs) the the 80s. I mean, you know. (laughs) So, um, you know, bigger, louder, faster, you know, everything was, you know, kind of like that stuff. So it was kind of in the shred guitar thing as a guitar player. And I was also, uh, there, there a couple of funny things about the whole story of how I got into this and it sort of ties together, but I had, a, I remember reading in the early 80s about the Gizmotron that was created by Lowell Cream in Tennessee C. It was a little device that would bow the wheels on the, on the uh, you know, like little rosin wheels or something like that. It, it a mechanical thing. And those things, unfortunately, I guess they're back on the market now. Somebody re-engineered them and they're better now. But back then there were, you know, these horrible manufacturing problems. But anyway, it was a, it was something I, that I just, oh, wow, bow guitar, you know, like, and I would do all these whale sounds and volume sounds with my guitar. I used to do that in the, uh, uh, you know, school choir as an accompanist. And I had a teacher named Ron McFarland, whose famous son, Seth, I remember as a, little rug rat and coat ball glasses doing Fred Frillenstone perfectly. 
so Ron had basically, uh, he used to comment to me, he goes, you sound more like a cellist than a guitar player, you know, just because I was really, I was less involved, you know, in, I mean, yeah, sure, I got into technical playing things, but I really was less interested in all that. I, it was more about the expression and the feeling and the emotion in the notes and somehow getting it out that way. So that was, it was an expression thing. And then by the later 80s, I did a sort of a retreat trip. I think it was probably about 21, 22-ish, maybe. And uh, in my grandmother's place in Connecticut. And I remember one winter night, it was January. I was reading up on violins because I was thinking, how can I make this bow guitar thing? You know, how can I, you know, I, want, I figured if I studied everything possible about violins, like I was going to geek out and digest this one inch thick section in the V section of a 1948 uh, encyclopedia. And in the middle of that somewhere, there was a tiny little paragraph about the Sarpeggioni. And it just, it, I sprang off my bed. I was excited. I was just like, F, yes, I am going to have an Arpeggioni. And it was like, I had no idea what I'd gotten myself into at that point, but that was probably the watershed moment that it was like, okay, so I became obsessed with that. I, you know, I had, later I had, had a job at a, an aircraft drafting firm in uh, Van Nuys. My, my boss was an astronaut. That's another story. But, or, and I was around these World War II engineers that, you know, designed those old aircraft back then. So these are the engineers that I trained under. So I don't have like these degrees and things all over the wall. But I was just very fortunate to be around some good people, you know, that kind of got me into that thing. So I was, I was making early drafts of what this thing is. It's, it's, it started there. I was, you know, doing a guitar repair business and the, on the side. You know, I mean, I worked with my hands and I did a lot of very art related things to begin with. So I think it kind of, it all connected, made sense. And I had also, subsequently, I made a lot of, uh, there was a lot of years where I was in that business of fixing instruments and selling instruments in stores. And I had a following of students. It was the nineties for something else. You know, I collaborated with a crazy Russian Latvian guy that, uh, you know, on the first one, but I realized over time that I really had the only way to really get it exactly how I'm, I had it in my mind, my heart, was just to make it with my own hands. Cut out the middleman. Get all the, uh, you know, all the, everybody's opinions. No, no, go away. Let me just get my thing the way I want. So as the, as the world's, you know, the all snob foolery that I was encountering, you know, oh, how could you build an arpeggio on oh, it's so you know, it was like, it really was like I was, uh, I was bringing up the embarrassing uncle on the uh, family tree with the arpeggio. It was really funny what the resistance was, but I, I did it. And then, and then I came, um, but I think after the nineties, I had uh, revisited the design and I wanted something that would sit, you know, pretty much like in my, I had a sort of a cutaway right here. You can't see it's kind of dark, but where it would rest like this and I can just grab a bow basically and, you know, bow the thing. I'm not even warmed up or tuned up here, so I don't know what's going to happen. It didn't, you know, come out that way at first. I mean, obviously, I, I had to do some iterations, but it, I, because I had designed one 10 years prior and I found out where the shortcomings were because the original one had a scale length that was more like guitar. It was like 25 and a half inch scale and everything was, you know, very guitar-like. The problem is the more guitar-like you make it, the worse it is <laughs> for me. And I was, I was actually having ergonomic issues. I, would be, I was playing a lot of it, but my shoulders and my back were really cramping up real bad. I was getting numb. And so, and that's also with the bows, I wound up getting, getting super light bow now. And that's another story. One, one day I was in the, the store. I used to work at Castles in um, San Fernando. And that was back, uh, you know, there were the place where Wayne's World was filmed. So for like eight years of my life, I was an assistant manager there. And, you know, we had a uh, had my garage little thing going on uh, on the side, so that was kind of when everything was kind of marinating together. Um, but I, I had to revisit the scale length because it was hurting me, and so I instead of going straight to the drafting board like I did in, at the dawn of the '90s, I I said, "Oh no, I'm going to get this thing to feel right first before it goes to the drawing." Basically, I took foam and cardboard templates, and I was just getting everything to feel like I had imagined it. I wanted it to feel. And I made the first prototype, and then that was another, you know, that was a snowball to a mountain, basically. It, it was a, getting the avalanche. I had no idea what I was getting into, and it was really 
kind of interesting because it, it coincided with the time that my father um, that summer had, you know, passed away. Uh, this is 02. And I kind of immersed myself into this thing. And I had, uh, just picked up my prototype from the shop. I actually had it painted. I can't believe I went through all this stuff to make it really super golden and all that kind of stuff. The good news is it, it did do what it was supposed to in terms of it felt right. And I was not in pain playing the thing anymore. I was still working out. This was a, a solid body electric, by the way. So I had to work out all the physics issues with the pickup system. And because what happens is when you bow a string, it, it moves side to side. So when we, when we bow it, 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 it'll move in the direction of the bow. And when we pluck a string, it kind of goes in a round elliptical mode fashion. But when we bow it, it's like this. It just goes horizontally. So the pickup systems, you know, that work in guitars don't necessarily work in that regard. You get a very horrible, weak sound out of it. So I had to work out all that kind of stuff. At the same time, I had people asking me about my, my uh, previous one. I think somebody had read a blog back east. Uh, my first customer was a guy named Doug, who is a school teacher, calculus professor, parachute instructor, you know, kind of guy. And uh, so I told him, well, I said, I'm kind of going back to it again. And I actually, it took me, now that I think about it, it took me a month to answer the uh, email. During that time, I went to Porter's Books. I don't know if anybody remembers Porter's Books, but it used to be a chain of stores I used to go to. It wasn't Amazon. And so I went and bought the, this book called Complete Idiot's Guide for HTML. <laughs> that was me, you know? I mean, I didn't even know what a hosting site was. I didn't know anything. It was all dial-up back then, too. So it was like I was putting together this really horrible little website. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I put the picture up of the uh, the prototype, and the next thing you know, we're talking. It's like I took a deposit, and I'm like, "What did I just get myself into?" And I just had no, and I didn't have a shop, I didn't have tools. Yeah, I had a friend down the street who had a guitar shop, and I was doing some other things when I was at Castles. We had a little line of instruments I was starting to do, but that kind of didn't pan out. You know, so I, I went back on this thing, you know, pretty much full force, and then within that same month. And we're talking like, okay, this is like November, December of 2002. Loga Torkian, who's a famous, now he's like, you Google him with my guitar vial, he calls it his command. His wife, uh, later on, I mean, this was like, this was pre-wife and pre-family. Uh, <laughs> uh, Azam Ali, and her voice is heard in 300 and just a lot of other stuff. So she's worked with Serge Tankian, but has by herself has a successful uh, solo career. Uh, Loga has, was a guitar player and he was like really super deep into this microtonal guitar and a classical guitar and Turkish saz and all this kind of really exotic quarter tone kind of stuff. And they were, they were actually originally from Iran, I guess, and they kind of got out of there after that 79 period. But anyway, uh, Loga and I hit it off. He came, he came, he said, I'm in LA and and I'm like, okay, this is from the same website, you know, back then. So he comes by and, and I was operating a store at the time. And um, he came by like, I don't know, and I put him in a lesson room for a minute and he would mess around with the instrument. Finally, we we're in the back of my garage one day and we were just, you know, he says, all right, you know, like I definitely want to get this going. And so what I didn't know was he was going to take this instrument and go into all these studios in Hollywood. And so before I knew it, I had a bunch of producers and, you know, composers uh, calling me that he didn't even know. So like he's in a, st a studio doing a session, some guy in the background pulling out his phone and calling his friend kind of thing. It was that it was that like electric and viral. Well, what, within months, I was like escalating a, a long build queue and I was still working the bugs out. <laughs> You know, you want to talk about trial by fire? I felt like Bill Gates in the scene of, um, and no Bill Gates, by the way, but I mean, like, I mean, I don't, you know, I'm not that guy. Um, but what I meant, there was a movie called Pirates of the Silicon Valley that came out a long time ago, I think 99-ish or something. And it had a scene in there where, you know, he's like selling DOS before he even had a prototype. Just, I mean, off the cuff. Well, well yeah, what do you call it? DOS, disk operating system or something like that. But my point is that it was like, I kind of like, oh my God, what did I get myself into? 
you know, and I, and, and at this point, you know, I have a family and, you know, I've got uh, my wife and my you know, stepson and um, just, uh, I didn't have any other better options. This was it, <laughs> which is a good problem to have, right? The, you know, the builds just came along and they get better and the demand escalated. But it was to the point where even early on, these people were incensed that I did not have a showroom full of instruments, that I didn't have a warehouse pumping these out, that I didn't have some factory. It's like, it was like I was expected to be this tycoon mogul running a big operation overnight. And I'm still developing the instruments. So honestly, this thing has been a crowdfunded experiment up to this point for 20 years. So the fact that it's actually out there in a lot of movies and it's, it's shaking some things up. Now, I, I'm sort of the weird maverick um, misfit in the room when it goes to guitar festivals and things like that. I'm not violin enough for violin people. I'm not guitar enough for them. But they get, they're all like annoyed that, oh my gosh, everybody's flocking to a stable. What is this thing? At times it can be a lonely existence, but then at the same time, it's just very... To me, what I love about this whole thing, though, is I get to meet some of the most awesome musicians, people, composers. So it's just the circle of people is different. It's not like I'm, if I, I would not be in business if I had to try to sell these things to poor rock musicians because, and that breaks my heart right now because there's a lot of people who, you know, it's unapproachable for. And even if I could, I couldn't build them, build them fast enough. Which is kind of funny because the you know you talk about like something about a current project. Well, currently I'm building now. Most of my other builds are like wooden ones. And okay, so I had to go off camera to get this. This is a, a one that's being in, in the white being built. But I normally I have not been building a lot of these wooden ones as much because I've been working with composites a bit. And I'm going in that direction because it's uh, I can make something that can really. You see, the thing is, when I build these things, I don't want to see them. Again. I only want to see them on Instagram and I want to hear them. I don't want to see them in my shop. <laughs> right. You don't want to have to repair them. Any repairs or modifications, I just don't have the bandwidth for it. And it's like, I, it's really such a dilemma because there are repair people around the world who see this thing and they're absolutely frightened of it. and They don't want to work on it. They don't understand it. And that's, I'm not saying, because I think some of the best luthiers in the world that are a lot that ever lived are alive today out there. So, and it's just, the bar has gotten, it's almost like you have amateurs who can just play circles around musicians, right? You just play circles around, you know, some of the most famous people. We have, I mean, the, the bar has kind of come up a lot and somebody wants a, a, a violin that's as good as a Stradivarius, you know, you, you can get it done. So my point is that there are there's a very high level of talent out there. And it's it's wonderful and it, it keeps me on my toes in that in that way. But at the same time, I tend to go down a different rabbit hole. And so this one here is uh, this is a composite. Uh, pro this is a prototype, by the way. But I'm making all the molds and toolings for it. So all this engineering that's kind of like Yamaha level ish kind of stuff. I've been doing. On a on a like a on a bootstrap uh, for the last several years. So weekends and evenings when I you know I might be making molds and you know cooking up very playing with chemicals I guess you know just getting everything just so. But really I want something that's, that just that can be built. And if if it was factory scalable, it 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 could be done where it can have actual technicians making the parts and the parts go together with precision. Also, the engineering that goes into it. I mean, I'm, even though this this top here, this is kind of a... So the top plates, I'm just, you know, even, the outer surfaces are wood. Um, but the inner is like a carbon fiber, um, you know, balsa sandwich. And I'm really trying to get them to really have that sound. And I found that even though we're mixing up composites, that even the wood matters still. It, it'll contribute to, you know, how it, how it acts. So I have to be very selective about that still. So it's not like I'm taking plastic or something like that. It was, you know, it's very, very curated, like a mad chef with, you know, various ingredients. And it's just, that's what I'm doing. The benefit and upside is these things are not going to crack in various weather changes. You know, that's the problem. If you notice that wood is kind of like a sponge. And if you take water to it, it'll swell up. 
and then when you know a couple of days go by, you notice it shrinks and dries on your sink. You know, it's it's like that. Well, what happens is when you have a sudden rain, it swells the wood up, and then when it gets super duper dry, desert California, uh, like we're having right now, we have a little bit of that going on. It can crack, so that back and forth can be really hard on an instrument. And then if you're traveling around the world, I guess we did a little more of that a few years ago, more often, but uh, traveling with a musical instrument is a terrifying thing for a, a musician because there, there's always that dreaded, it was, it's almost like a roulette game. You get to the gate of an aircraft and they're going to go, sorry, gate check are the two things the musician never wants to hear. And it was, it's crazy. The airline industry is like, you know, you book a seat for Mr. Cello and they decide they don't want Mr. Cello on the plane. You know, and it's like all this drama and all these other things. Uh, like for instance, I don't like to have uh, batteries inside my instruments with electronics because, the, you know, there's certain inspectors like the TSA will rip it apart. And I've seen instruments disabled that way. So I'm having to go through all this engineering to make the actual experience of owning the instrument better and smoother. You know, if I could put all that stuff outside of the instrument some way or just have it so it's, you know, in a different package, great. But I really wanted to be able to be built and last a long time and not have to deal with all this climate adjustments all the time, things like that. Or, and, and, you know, there's also, too, the fingerboards are a different story altogether. Start, and that's part that ties into this whole same story. Uh, the early fingerboards looked a bit like this. They had fret wire. On them, just like a guitar, and unfortunately, I couldn't bend it to the right rate, you know, the right geometry, without the frets wanting to fly out because of the physics of the whole thing. And so I was kind of, you know, having to do all this horrible epoxying and gluing these things in. And I was never really 100% happy. I mean, a guitar is relatively easier to do because it's flatter, and you can just kind of level it all down and polish it up. And so I later went to a CNC project process, which did not work out, by the way, robots making wood patterns and stuff like that. That's great for big guitar factories and stuff, but this just didn't do it for this thing. And this is a kind of an example, though, where I did laid in, you know, like a jewelry wire into it. Now, that's problematic, too. Not only was that 10 times the labor of a, of a guitar to do that fingerboard that might not actually, you know, you, woods, you can sometimes get a dead spot or a loud spot because it's organic. And so you, it's unpredictable. You can go through a zillion hours making something only to find out, oops, it's got this and there's these wolf tones here and all that kind of stuff. I wound up one day, and it's typical of my, my I guess my rebellion against all the things snob foolery that, that kind of holds things back and progress, I suppose. I just was like, you know, regardless of tradition, regardless of bias, regardless of material, what would the ultimate playing surface be like? And I just came up with this, you know, this is like a composite part. I could do this with precision each time. And it's, uh, it's, got, a car it's got a graphite base in there and it's like a shell and there's a carbon fiber layup that goes on the inside. So it's a whole process. So it's very, very strong. It's reasonably light. Best of all, it's just got, it just has a very even sound, so you, every note is the right same volume. But the, the big deal is we don't chew up these expensive cello strings overnight. Because when you have metal to metal, it, it, uh, it'll wear. Now on a guitar, like a steel string guitar, that seems to eat up nickel frets. Okay, but if a classical nylon string guitar, you notice the three bass strings on the you know, lower three, are silver wrapped and they get worn onto the frets. So the frets literally chew them up. It's like that with cello strings. They're not meant for these things. The people who make those strings are not thinking some guy with an arpeggioni and metal frets is going to try to play this thing. In fact, it's a chicken and the egg problem. What came first, the guitar vial or the guitar vial string? But then when I got, you know, I'm using these Diodario uh, helicords, uh, which are, they have a nice little pluck to them as well. So they have a, they, you can kind of get a little of both out of it, which is kind of cool. Um, but they also have a very fast bow attack, which I like. And we went through this whole process many years ago where we were in the studio and we were trying miking, putting up the big mics and, you know, hearing the difference between the different brands. So we were thinking, okay, it's going to be Tomastics, it's going to be Piastros, right? We just thought all the usual suspects. 
Uh, no, it actually, the Daniel <laughs> Hill course won the day. And so I've been using them ever since. But the problem is, again, it was like they were getting chewed up. So I'd be getting these emails. Why are you using three cubes getting chewed up? And it's like 40 bucks every time I pop it. Or it would not play in tune because the windings had come off. So this thing solved it. It just pretty much, you know, it made it so that I could make the things and get a nice predictable result every time. And it really is a very wonderful playing experience. It just silky smooth, no, no fret edges. So when the wood shrinks and the metal doesn't, we don't get these little sharp edges. That's what happens with the climates and woods and strings. So it just turned out wood was the absolute worst choice for a barbile fingerboard. And I think it also probably killed the original arpeggioni uh, because they're just they are extremely hard to build. And oh, there's been luthiers who've really tried, but there's been a big road of failure for the last 200 years. And so the, I find it kind of crazy and it's surreal and remarkable that somehow I'm still standing, that, that somebody actually made a living or a life out of arpeggionics. That's, that's crazy. But you know, to do stuff like that, we have to get a little crazy to make it work. You talk about creativity, it's really, that's what it is. Creativity is a, a, also an expression of solving problems. Yeah, you've definitely tackled a lot of unusual music instrument making problems. And then, of course, there's so many things where you're, you're saying you're not sticking to tradition. Like, for example, you had to make your own fingerboard, whereas usually they're made with ebony wood. You know? Yeah. But, but that's okay to move forward and try well, that's, new things. That's, yeah. There's a secondary problem, which I should mention, is that a lot of the woods that we've been relying on are being highly regulated now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's a nightmare for people who've traveled over borders only to have their precious instrument confiscated and destroyed if they've crossed the wrong border. And it was the wrong wood of the wrong origin. And so we have this, this whole CITES kind of thing. See, it's, it's another thing you can you, that's people can research. But so going into that, I'm also trying alternatives to woods. Now, yes, I did mention I'm using carbon fiber, but I'm also experimenting with things like flax and hemp, also plant-based resins, which are essentially a flax linseed-ish kind of epoxy uh, I get from France. I, you know, sometimes I have to reach around the world a little bit just because you know, there's these little certain things I can only get from certain places, which right now is kind of a, a concern because I, I use these uh, Fittner uh, precision tuners on my um, on my instruments. And, you know, they're in Germany and they've had a, you know, their factory's been sort of, so I've been cleaning off all the shelves of all the U.S. distributors right now because I don't know when things will level off. I hope they do at some point. but. Um, it's really been quite a ride, you know, through that whole thing. But anyway, so the materials, you know, like a back to that is that I have this uh, model, well, I call this model the 10X slash OGV, and the uh, OGV is my little funny little personal acronym of the Operation Ghetto Bear Day, which is the green ghetto, you know, because if uh, everything gets sort of like, I mean, I can't even buy, for example, when I was doing, I was doing violin French polishing you know, with, with shellacs and things like that, where we melted in alcohol. I can't even go to the Home Depot and buy denatured alcohol anymore because I'm in California. Same with mineral spirits. So a lot of these things that we're used to using, we're, we're living in a world where supplies and supply chains are changing. And the wood use is starting to be a thing too. It's, you know, they're worried about deforestation and a lot of those kind of things. And I'm for, you know, responsible agriculture, fast growth things that are like hemp, for example, bamboo kind of things and that are things that can, that can potentially be used. So I'm kind of taking a preemptive adaptation in that direction as well, because if we go Operation Ghetto Verde and, the, and everybody else is panicking <laughs> and I'm the one who's going, I did my homework. <laughs> You know, I would rather still be building instruments, even if I had to make them out of sea kelp. You know, I don't care. I just, you know, it's really about the music and, and you know, and making something sustainable, I suppose. And that doesn't mean that wood is a tough act to follow. You know, I, I love working with wood still, but I've had to watch it too, because it's a lot of dust and, you know, 
my grandfather and my father both had COPD. So it's one of those things. And I'm allergic to all those exotic woods, by the way. So I stopped using a lot of rosewoods and things that are from tropical areas, mostly just because I'm allergic to it also. So I stuck with North American woods mostly because they're, they're in this hemisphere. So they kind of, even in their afterlife as instruments, they handle it a lot better than rosewood does. For example, rosewood, you know, it's a very oily wood that comes from, you know, the tropical forest. Well, yeah, if you throw it in the desert, it's going to crack. It's like celery, you know, it's, it, you throw it outside and eventually it's going to be this crumbly little vegetable, I guess. Anyway, I know that's a, that's a, that's an earful of stuff, but. Uh, oh, no, that's fantastic. I mean, it's so interesting to hear how you got your start and how you just were just courageous and powering through and being creative and and in literally inventing new things to make the instrument what it is. What is your creative process like? You know, now that you've gotten things down to a little more of a science and a little bit of a pattern, is it easier to make them? You know, do you wake up every day and you work on things or? Early on, like when we're doing this as a side hustle, you know, generally you're not on some somebody else's clock when you're doing it, but you're kind of, you know, you're supported a little bit. So you can kind of be a little more ad hoc and crazy with creativity and that's usually when it's at its best is when you're in a flow and you could you're just on a roll you lose your sense of time and you're just oh you can't get the ideas down fast enough a lot of that may involve you know like using technology a little bit like okay i've got an iphone you know just so barco dictate a whole siri thing into it and edit it later but at least i get the ideas down, that kind of thing but what i find is that time management becomes a on one hand, you've got to be disciplined enough to be able to run your business and take care of things. On the other, when it's at the expense of your creative flow, that's when it can be a little crazy. But an idea comes at two o'clock in the morning, write it down real fast, check it back out in the morning, go to sleep, get rid of it. You know, Really, I found that it's very tough and stressful to actually fight your natural circadian rhythms of things. So if you take time to understand what that is, how our sleep patterns go when we're at our peak in our day, when we're not. We start really analyzing that stuff and going, okay, my natural thing, if I tune the whole world out, what would it be like, really? And that's also balancing, you know, family time. So it's like, okay, I'm domesticated now. You know, I mean, my wife has dinner at a certain time and we, that's our kind of thing. So, you know, my body got into that flow. When I was a bachelor, I would be probably up like all night. I have a process, the, a typical good day of creativity and productivity going hand in hand where I have a three cycle in the day kind of thing where it's like I come in set the tone I, I it's what I call play pray and basically I'll put on some nice mu you know music soft whatever music that just puts it in a good space I'll have my coffee I'll go around the shop with a broom and I'm like sweeping up and I've got my little pads here okay with me along the way with my little dry markers okay so i've got mark dry marker boards at various stations but i'll have you know something i'm drawing around so that way if something hits me i just I, i'll put it down or i'll at least get that so now i'm kind of getting in a flow but i'm cleaning up the shop putting things away so i know where they're at because you know the hurricane the day before is you know you're that's the whole thing you just get in this mess hurricane that looks like some sort of like adhd CPTSD salad of something that's tossed. So you come in and you kind of like, you know, clean that up. But in the process of cleaning it up, you, you get, get a good feeling everything's in its place, but your ideas are flowing. So I do that in the first part of the day. And that kind of sets the rudders a bit to what's next. This whole process is something I call sharpening the shop, but it's also sharpening the mind and sharpening, you know, the, just throwing it down. So I got the sketch, the thought pads, the sketch, and I'm also sketching layouts of the ideas. So in other words, if I have an engineering thought, I'm doing a quick sketch of my idea at that station. And I'll walk, and that might just take me a minute or two, but I'm just kind of there in the moment. And if I'm afraid I'm gonna really forget it, I take my iPhone and I'll take a picture of it to review it later. So these boards, they get scrubbed, but I'll, I'll kind of catalog them in the phone a little bit. But the afternoon I do the cut. So the, the First part of the day is like play, pray, plan, create, sharpen the knives, get all the thoughts out, set the rudders and the, you know, the ailerons of how we're, what we're going to fly at. 
and then it's cut, poured, glue, dry. By that time, I'm exhausted. That that is kind of like a typical day when the you know I don't have people coming around. Now, obviously, that all changes up if I have appointments coming in, or even sometimes a spontaneous visitor can be a good one. I mean, um, I've had a couple. One is actually uh, is a protege now, so I mean, just things like that. It sounds like it's wonderfully immersive and creative, and it sounds like it's very soul filling to be able to just work on this passion project that you've had. Yeah, you know, and the thing is, anytime I've had like a protege, I always try to have a culture of creativity. I want to give them some, like when they're practicing on little things and giving them a little bit of a canvas to work with too. I might lay out the lines and stuff like that. For example, I've got this one. It's still in the cleanup process. You've got a bunch of goop on here right now. It'll glow in the dark, but it's kind of like stock with a, oh, an applique. And this was one I was probably going to toss. It just had a little blem on it. And I'm like, no, let's let's uh, fix it with some, you know, some creativity and art. One of my former proteges, uh, this is coming up in April, April the 9th and 10th. We're going to do a Saturday, Sunday. I'm doing like sort of an open house thing. It's just a dual exhibit. All of my stuff will be hanging on this wall. And then I'm going to clean out the front section of the shop and throw tablecloths out and uh, some trade show racks. And my uh, protege from the past, who's an accomplished guitar builder today, Marvin Guitars on Instagram. Shout out to Keith. And it will have his guitar. So we're going to do our we just market, do our own marketing events, you know, sort of. We'll see what happens. We're just we're going to have a little fun with it, you know, and we'll probably do some social. You'll see a lot of us on Instagram those days. I'm pretty sure we'll kind of just maybe throw some live feeds out. I don't know what we're going to do. It's, it just sounds like we're just going to we'll create. But that's the whole thing. Is like you know, it's always been a culture of creativity uh, in, in the shop. And, like I said, the other thing that, you know, when you do, when you do train people and you have uh, assistants, there's going to be mistakes. Some of them are going to be dear. I've had a couple of instruments dropped in the past that were, that was supposed to go to our overhead or something like that, you know, stuff that can happen. But I found that a lot of the times the best people have been the one I've had to be really long suffering a couple of times with some of those kind of things, you know. It's not if you're going to make mistakes, it's how you recover from the mistake that defines it. Very true. I'll give you an example. Like in the guitar industry, we've seen a lot of mistakes just getting repeated because people liked the mistake. For example, like I think a PRS Guitars had a story, but it, it's typical of this whole industry, really. There was a, a glue seam in the middle of the guitar. It was Carlos Santana's guitar they didn't like. So he said, well, let's just route our channel and we'll put a bunch of abalone in it and make it, you know, art. Well, it became a feature. Now people expect when they buy a Carlos Santana guitar, it's going to have that abalone pattern. So we're, we're basically repeating people's favorite mistakes, which is, I think that's the other thing about music and art in general, which I think is just kind of done a lot of damage, I think, with like Pro Tools and Photoshop in a way. It's almost like metaphorically speaking, it's like Photoshop, We've made people so picture perfect that it sells a lot of cosmetics. It makes women feel like they, they can't live up to that expectation because the picture is so dang perfect, but that's not real life. And the same thing with musical performances. We could just completely perfect the heck out of them, edit the heck out of them. But sometimes those little human oopses are kind of part of the, part of the performance, part of the experience. You just pick the one that has the fewest mistakes and the one mistake you like or something. And that's a true performance, right? But I mean, it can be that way with anything you're doing creative, creatively. So this drive of perfection, we have to find a jumping off point sometimes because at some point it has to shift. And that's the other anxiety that's that, that again, you know, you have a finished model, everything's just so, everything's just, oh, but this one little thing. I got to go back and then, oops, you just got yourself into another rabbit hole and you're not getting out. Well, it's going to miss the truck that day. You know? <laughs> so um, we try to, we try to, you know, keep the quality as high as possible. But at the same time, it's like, you know what, that's a feature. And the, the guitar industry, unfortunately, has been that way. When I was working in stores, it would like, oh, this one on the wall is great. And, uh, but I want one out of the box. It's, you know, pristine, fine, here, take it out of the box. And they pull it out and it plays like a dog. And they're like, why does that look like that? Well, it's like, you know, the violin industry is kind of the opposite. I think it's sort of like, if it looks like a shiny, perfect violin, it's, it screams cheap. And it screams, I don't want it. They want something old and beat up. So 
it's funny because guitar makers have been relicking guitars, kind of like, you know, expensive jeans that have been pre old and worn kind of thing. You know, it's like if they're old and worn, they're worthless. But if we did it at the factory, it's worth, you know, I don't know. But so I like to celebrate the little nature spots and things like that that are in the materials in the woods. Yeah. Yeah. Just sort of let the imperfections shine, you know, the characteristics shine. Or embellish the imperfection itself and just make it louder. I did this one <laughs> several years ago. This guy Eisler, who's a famous TV uh, composer now, but back when he was starting off, he has one of my earlier instruments. I had one that, because I couldn't build them fast enough, and I had one that had knots in them. I accented the knots. I pushed wine corks into it, and I made these wine cork knobs, and, and I dipped it in purple and, you know, like a burgundy color. I called it Naughty Chuck. It was, it was named after the two-buck Chuck from Trader Joe's of the day, but... <laughs> Naughty Chuck, right? Um, so Naughty Chuck is alive and well, still making TV tracks, as far as I know. Um, and it, I guess it got him a lot of gigs uh, in those days, which it wound up like an ABC, this series called Revenge and stuff like that. That's how he got the gig was with that instrument. There's a story that people might find interesting. There's a famous white, pearl white build that I made for Tyler Bates. And I'm letting out a nice little story here. It might be an exclusive, I don't know, but. So Tyler Bates has this white pearl one that I built. I was originally, this is NAMM show, 2004, 2005, January, I think. It was a body that had a big knot on it. And one of the guys at the shop said, hey, should we run this one? It's got a knot on it. I said, and I thought of this and just some little Bible verse came to me or something like that. It was like the stone that was rejected became the chief cornerstone. So that kind of came up and I'm like, build it. And so, you know, we bonded it up and I sent it to my friend, Pat, he's one of the best painters of guitars out there, Pat Wilkins, shout out Pat. And I had him do this pearl white because I was intending this guitar for, for the file for Joe Satriani, who I had had some interaction with at the time. He's a really nice guy. So I figured a pearl would look great on stage under stage lights from the back row. I didn't want something that was like, just look too dark and sunbursty and stuff like that. And plus, it, it solved the problem. And we had, you know, we had a little blem on there and it paints something white. It looks perfect. So just a little hidden body work in there. But that one wound up in Guitar Player Magazine twice in 2005. It was reviewed. And it, went, it was in, Joe had it for a minute, but I think he, it was like one of those things where he realized that it would take him a lot of practice to get good at it. And he was on a, you know, album tour schedule that just, you know, he had to be excellent at everything he did. You know, so it was like taking the time off or off road was a little too much, but great guy though. And we got on well. So when I got, uh, what happened was when I, at that time, I, I mentioned Loga earlier at the beginning of this story. Well, Loga's friend, Tyler Bates, who happened to be the composer that later did 300 with the, the instrument, spoiler alert. He reached out and he's like, I said, look, Tyler, I said, it's going to take me nine months to get to, to yours in the queue. I do have one coming back from, you know, Guitar Player Magazine and, and Joe Satriani or whatever. And it's pearl white. If you're not picky about the color, he didn't care. Uh, I mean, he would have probably preferred a sunburst, but it's like, you know, and I, I was thinking to myself, great. I made this instrument that's going to be, that was made to be on stage. And now it's just going to be hidden in a dark studio. And what actually happened was, well, no, it was, it wound up being a watershed moment with 300. And unfortunately at the time, Tyler was kind of keeping it hush hush about the instrument because he didn't want his dirty little secret out. That's the thing. I became Hollywood's dirty secret, you know? <laughs> and so that, and then he wound up doing other movies. Finally, eventually, I think Azam, Loga's wife, and they'd all worked together in the same circles. Just why don't you help Jonathan out? Come on, man, be public with the thing a little bit more. So he wound up on the cover of Electronic Music Magazine in 2009 with that same instrument, the white one. The story of the pearl white one, and it's all over these blogs he's done over the years. I mean, there's, there are, output company that makes recording equipment that does his blog he's on a, one of those so he appears a lot with that instrument he's done many albums uh i guess marilyn manson but just uh, tons of series and movies so it's still in service today is what i'm saying but um again that's going back to like you know how you creatively overcome the imperfections in life mm -hmm. because that's what it is i think we if we think that somehow everything's just you know, unicorns and rainbows. And if you go off that little rainbow course, you know, it's, it's 
it's all over and it's not it's it's just it's sort of like a little bit of a, a slalom course of things I, I suppose we're gonna dig into a couple of questions about you before we end our show one is if you could do any other creative art other than what you're doing what would it be you know um it's kind of funny uh, before I actually got in, really into music or you know guitar itself um I was like I love drawing and I love painting that might be something, of course, uh, also creative writing, but I'm really, I say creative writing, but I'm more of a non-fictional kind of guy. You know, I'm not really, I'm not making up my characters that much, but that would be kind of fun. Um, it could be that. I don't know. Maybe I would get into other media. I suppose I blended in with the film composer crowd because I guess a little bit of part of me has a little bit of a cinematic, you know, thing of like, I like graphics and pictures of screens and sounds and sound designs and things like that. So that's kind of what this thing does for people too. It's sort of a sound design tool. They, they can make all kinds of crazy, creepy noises in certain little places as well as, you know, musical ones or both, I guess, at the same time. I don't know. But yeah, as far as uh, that, I mean, I, I just see myself really, I'm, I'm an artist that got kind of trampled over by productivity of industry. There is that artist that's still in there. But, you know, I really was a recording artist. That's really the ironic part of it. The sad irony for me, in some ways, is that I created this instrument so that I could make my music and impress the world with all my skills, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, that didn't go that way. It was, it was kind of like, oh, man, yeah, dude, you sound really good. Um, anyway, about your instrument. <laughs> anyway, about your instrument. I want one of those. And so I became an instrument maker that way. But again, I had to somehow shed off and a lot of the traditional luthier kind of trappings of everybody wants to seemingly just copy the tradition or just get in that. And that's great. I, I, we need to have people who keep all that stuff alive. We, we need to have orchestras that are full of uh, classical instruments. We need classical musicians who can interpret the stuff. I'm sort of the improviser jazz approach person to classical music, I guess. I just, I'm on the fly. I hear something, I'll just play it, and never play it the same way twice, you know. So it's, it's that way, it's fluid. But creative, creativity, artist, free, I guess, I don't know. It all, it's full circle, really. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like you use most of the, most of those things in your work anyway, you know, sketching out new ideas or or having to do the business side of things. You know, it sounds like you do a lot of creative pursuits regardless. Well, yeah. And again, when you have like a good brain dump session, and sometimes it coincides with the moment you're drinking coffee and pushing a broom. And it, you need to capture that lightning in a bottle because you might not get it back when you're in the riptide of the day. Yes. So you get it down and then you come back and you're, you look at the little marker board you were at a day or ago and you go, hmm, okay, that's an interesting thought, you know, and you start, you develop it. And if it sticks, it sticks and it makes it onto the marker board the next day. If it's, eh, you kind of just let it disappear, but it can be in the iPhone and come back up a year later and go, wait a minute, what was I thinking? That was pretty cool, you know? So just get it down somehow. But I think what go back to what we were saying a second ago is that I think creativity and all those kind of things is really a, it's a whole sphere we're just talking about different media but somebody can think in different media all the time if it's paint if it's digital media if it's sound if it's architecture design drafting i have all these different backgrounds you know and applied geometry and all this kind of stuff i mean you know i mean when i'm having to engineer this stuff this is kind of like a complex piece of geometry with Pythagorean divisions it was actually Pythagoras who kind of came up with these, you know, half steps, you know, kind of thing and the calculations of where they fall. There's there's a lot of that stuff. And that's the funny thing, too, is like we can go through all these 12 years of life as a kid, getting all this stuff crammed into us that we're not going to use and at the expense of being creative, I guess. But you're going to find there's applications for some of it. So you kind of want to take some of it with you. And then if you go down that rabbit hole later in life, you got that that door's still open. Nobody's going to stop you from doing your own studying. I don't think you have to have a, a license on the wall that says you did something. Just go and do it. And it's there. It's in the world. And somehow people are asking you the questions of kind of funny. I have a 
professors asking me questions. So it's kind of like, well, I don't know. I just did this every day. Nice. One more question for you. What do you wish you'd known when you first started on your journey? It almost ties into the last thing is I wish I didn't feel like I had to have permission to do something or approval because that's, and that's the, the trap that a lot of us can get into in life. Sometimes friends and family can be your, can, you know, squash you, you know, and if you let that and, you know, you just have to go and do it. I mean, I would say do it early and often, do your thing. And regardless, you know, it was funny. I was listening to this one book. I can't remember the exact one it was, one of my many audible books, but it was something in there was talking about how some people who've actually been the most successful people didn't quit their day job. They did it until it hurt until their other thing. And that's what happened to me. I just got to the point where I was too stressed out. I had my side hustle was getting too heavy to carry unless I cut the cord, but do whatever it takes in the meantime to get your thing, to, to get some wind in the wings. One of my other favorite authors, which I think is kind of a good metaphor is the Icarus deception about flying too close to the sun. But then if you fly too low, you drag your wings into the ocean, then you drown. So it's like you got, you're, you're trying to find that space, but don't be, a, don't be afraid, you know, afraid to fly because that's what we're supposed to do. You know, a bird doesn't, you know, learn to fly unless it's like nudged out of the nest. And that's, sometimes life will do that to you. It'll nudge you out of that comfort zone. But that's the whole thing is the whole, this whole thing of security, safety, and comfort. That's, that's also a killer because it's really not the safe road. It's the, when people are so terrified of, do, of coloring outside the lines or just not keeping that dot connected, that's when we're kind of in the sort of, it stifles it, you know, and, but I wish I knew, I knew, wish I knew that starting out. So I spent the first half of my life in that, the second half of my life, it, I had to undo it and undoing it meant just going for it. And I think it was ironically after my father passed away, because, you know, being a dad, it's like, get a good job, get a good, all this kind of stuff, all this responsible stuff in a box, you know? And I, I wanted to get out of the box. I wanted to fly. And that's the thing you got to do is just don't be afraid to fly. At some point, you have to really listen to your own, what the voice that's in you inside and just go with it. It's almost like we were given these software programs, right? That are just wonderful programs. The problem is you can't take Photoshop and turn it into QuickBooks. Photoshop is really good at being Photoshop. You can make something that looks like QuickBooks in Photoshop, but it's not going to work. And so everybody's got a certain software package. You got to find out what that software package is. When you plug it in and everything lights up and it works, it's like, okay, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Keep going. You know, and that's the, those are the things I wish I did learn early on. If I were able to impart that to somebody younger than myself or just starting off and maybe struggling with just the idea of, you know, yeah, there's going to be a point in your life where it's not comfortable. You don't have the resources. You might have to squirrel it together. You might have to, but just, just start, you know, when I started this Toga Man thing, I, like I said earlier, I didn't have anything. I just, I had a day job at a shop. I had my little family and we were living in a modest little thing, but um, I didn't have all these machines and tools and implements and stuff like that. I had a chunk of alder, a rusty bastard file, blistered hands, and a dream. And it was just, it started from just take what you have that day and just do it. The other stuff will come as you go. And I just, I, I was selling instruments and buying machines. <laughs> just, you know, it, it sort of, you know, escalated. And also had to take some very, very scary leaps into an overhead situation I have not been in before. That's just scary, the, the frightening expenses and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, it's kind of like a goldfish. If you're stuck in a bowl, you're just going to stay that little goldfish. If you're put into a bigger pond, you're probably going to wind up being a koi fish, right? You might grow you know, to your environment. And that's the thing. You really have to surround yourself with people that are you admire and that are of the, you know, positive and encouraging people it's almost like i think uh who was it? I, I think it was um was it seth godin that was um oh the guy who started cd baby um anyway i'm having a brain moment there but he said something interesting he says call for directions and then as a metaphor in life of find out what that what what, what that destination or that thing place you want to get to just make a few 
calls, reach out, get somebody in line. They give you directions how to get there. Great. So it's sort of, you, know, you people are, would be surprised at how many professional people out there if you reach out to them and they're like, hey, you know, how do I get into this? Or, you know, how do you do this? That they, people are generally helpful. Okay. If you're on the, you know, on the street corner, it's like, hey, uh, excuse me, do, is there a Starbucks around here? Oh yeah, just go down the corner, you know, just, you know, ask for directions, you know, and, and just go for it. And I've heard success stories of one of the guys, one of my clients, uh, he did Game of Thrones, I guess, with my instrument for several seasons. His story is, I guess he showed up at Hans Zimmer's studio, uh, fresh out of Berkeley, and just, where's the coffee and where's the broom? And he just, it, it literally scaled from there. It turned out in those days, I guess, in the 90s, when a lot of these older guys didn't know how to operate all the sampling equipment, the new guys are, you know, hey, I can get under the hood of this, you know, and it's like, oh, hey, great, oh, well, you got this big project, you know, it's like, suddenly just being thrown into solving other people's problems. That's what it is too, is creativity is just, it's basically the fine art of solving problems. And engineering is the same is in that way too. It's sort of a, the fine art of solving problems. And I, I didn't know I was solving a problem that people didn't know they had by having this instrument because suddenly guitar players, guitar natives have an a instrument that's formatted to something they can understand. A lot of people know that D major chord, right? So now we can. So we've got a stringed instrument, and you know, we could, you know, with some practice and just you're kind of in a familiar place as a guitar player. Now the funny thing is, these things can be treated like a cello. Cellists can pick them up and adapt their way to it. The other thing is, um, and of course, with some weight in them, we can do the Jimmy Page thing with them, but they have to be weighted down a little bit, so solid body works. And I'm going to make a solid version of this one day, the same exact pattern. The, it also can be like a viola de spalla. I don't know if you're familiar with viola de spallas, but they're, or a viola, uh, it's also a pomposa, known as a pomposa. And it's, a, it's like cello tuning. It's like C, G, D, A, E, five strings. And a lot of the Bach uh, cello suites were probably written on that thing because technically a cellist is pretty frustrated when they don't have that high string to jump to, and it's it's not convenient on the fingerboard. So, but they they held they they're held like this. It turns out this little funny by feel design I came up with twenty some years ago can be held with a strap like this, and it can be bowed like a so a violinist can adapt to this thing pretty easily, and it's about the size of a viola de spall. In fact, we can put we can tune it like a viola de spalla if we had to. So it's pretty versatile. I, I like to think of this as a universal platform. So if we we're gonna do one design that can be patterned and tuned up in a variety of ways and played in different variety of ways. Now, I like I said at first, I was kind of annoyed that people wanted to not play it the way I play. You know, because like I said, I have the guitar vial stance where it's kind of like almost a viola de gamba thing, and I've got a leg peg under my right leg here. By the way, this little painting in the background, I don't know if you see it, but it's the toga man right here, the Notes Estacana, which is uh, where the water turns the wine. I don't know if you see that guy over there pouring the water and turns into wine there. It's a, a zoom in shot of a certain section of a Paolo Veronese painting where back in 99, I was kind of, you know, researching viola de gambas, which are similar, actually. They're, they're force tuned before cellos and violins actually existed. And they were, that's a funny story by itself. Um, the viola da gamba and the viol, they were basically bowed lutes and guitars that came from the Iberian section of Spain. And the Moroccans brought the bows over when they invaded. So it was kind of a Reese's peanut butter cup of kind of thing where the chocolate and the uh, peanut butter sort of had a meeting that day, a little crash, you know, thing. So. They were, they were taking the guitars of the day, the boots and the vihuelas, and, you know, bowing them. And so it was kind of an underhand bow grip, kind of like this. The, and so, but viola de gambas it, it really are played like that. And, and it's the beautiful instruments. There was the uh, movie Tu le Matan du Monde uh, that came out, um, I think about 1992, it, All the Mornings of the World in French. And it was about uh, the composer saint Colomb or... I don't know how you really pronounce it. Uh, Jonathan Dunford out there, the guy over in France would probably <laughs> take a little minor umbrage from me mispronouncing it. But 
anyway, so you have viola da gambas from those those times, and that's the toga man kind of solved the problem for me because see, my last name is Wilson. Wilson belongs on sports equipment, okay? It, you know, these two syllable guitar companies, Fender, Gibson, Martin, you know, all this kind of stuff. Well, it just didn't, it didn't work for me. And then of course the Stouffer and Arpeggioni sounded like a frozen Italian uh, meal at the supermarket. So I just, I kind of rebranded the Arpeggioni as the Toga Man guitar vial because Toga Man was sort of my smoking gun of the, you know, the age of, yes, people did play them that way once upon a time. And it turns out that's Veronese himself, the, the guy who painted it and all his rivals there, you know, really, I mean, it's just, it's, it's been done so long ago. It's almost so old. It's new. And uh, the Toga Man guitar vial thing just sort of solved my, my problem. It was sort of like, I got a little icon for my logo. That's great. Okay. You know, I don't have to deal with the Wilson sports equipment problem, common namesake vendors out there. So I had to kind of do something to break that up. So talk about creativity. That was my creative response to branding my crazy instruments. So there you go. Jonathan, thank you so much for being on the Creative Piecemeal Podcast. I hope we have to have you on the show again to dig into more of the wonderful questions and to hear more about what you're doing. Listeners, please check out the show notes to learn more about Jonathan. Definitely check out all the wonderful movies, video games, and recordings that use his amazing instrument. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Like the show? Have a question? Stop by the Facebook and Instagram pages. Links are in the show notes or search for a creative piecemeal podcast on social media and click follow for all the latest.